Aloha and welcome to Heritage Interpretation Guiding. I am Tim Merriman, your host, coming to you from the Big Island of Hawaii. I'd like to take you to a slide program to share some thoughts on a very important subject I've worked in all of my 55-year career in the field. I've been a park ranger that included the title of naturalist or interpreter at a state park in Illinois. I've been a nature center director in Colorado that was a nonprofit organization or non-governmental organization as it's called many places. I was the manager of research at Land Between the Lakes in Kentucky, a 170,000 acre national recreation area. And that was the first 38 years of my career. The last 17 years before retirement, I was the executive director of National Association for Interpretation, a professional association for helping over 5,000 professionals in 30 countries get better at interpreting natural and cultural heritage. Professional development was our major effort in the organization. During that time, I was a co-creator of the Certified Interpretive Guide Credential with Lisa Brochu, who is my spouse and my training partner at Artfield Associates. In 2000, when we created the course, it began to be offered and trained by a variety of trainers. We trained over a thousand trainers in our 12 years of working with that. And they've trained over 50,000 people with that credential. I happen to have a bachelor's in zoology with a teacher's certificate, master's in botany, aquatic ecology, and a PhD in communications, oral interpretation of literature. I wanna to suggest to you that interpretive approach to guiding is different. I think our objectives in tourism usually are more guests. We want more people to enjoy our experiences we create. We want return visits. We don't want it to be a one-off thing that people come to our, our island, for instance, at the big island of Hawaii or to a World Heritage Site or whatever. We want people to value the experience so much they might want to come back. We want better reviews on social media and more reviews. We actually want a long-term guest relationship. Very often, people who have an amazing guest experience as a tourist end up becoming donors, advocates, and contributors in other ways. They may promote your destination in a variety of ways, if they're a writer, a photographer, or just a person with a huge social media, media following. And so it's always a good thing. A lot of our guides in these businesses are paid primarily through the gratuities. They might have a base pay by their organization, but very often the gratuities are actually more. So that's another benefit. Definition of interpretation. I'm using one by Dr. Sam Hamm, a cognitive psychologist, retired professor from University of Idaho who taught interpretation. And his definition says that it's a mission-based approach to communications. And I believe in that. We work for real organizations. They have objectives. If they're a tourism organization, a park, a tour company, a zoo, a museum, a World Heritage Site, an art museum, any of those have a mission, and we should be representing that mission in what we do in guiding. We have to recognize, as he points out, that we're provoking an audience's discovery of their own personal meaning. They're not going to take away exactly the meaning that we give them. They're going to sort that within their own life experience, and they have a right to that. We give them information, very often the tangible traits of the site, when something happened or how big it is or how many people have been there or what tragic circumstances happened there. But when we use jargon, we lose our audience. We're much better to use universals. Family, love, death, joy, survival, hope, freedom. All of these different words that are shared by all humans on the planet are more likely to make a personal connection than using very specific terminology that may be usual in our profession, but not usual for our guest. Sam also pointed out that we're usually interpreting places, things, people, concepts. Those could include world heritage sites, cities or towns, heroes, sometimes heroes of unique events, cultures, zoos, nature preserves, sometimes even concepts like climate change. If you think about how guiding has been done in the past in most places, it's often been by lecture, very fact-laden, 
generally around a big topic. Often a guide has memorized what they're going to say. And very often it's, you're listening to it, it's audio, and they're showing you something. There's a visual component. We would suggest to you that what we want in interpretation is a conversation, two-way. We want to create an experience that's a bit broader than just a tour and you listening. We use storytelling as a part of that because very often there are anecdotes or stories that we can relate that help people understand where they are, why it's unique. We want to be authentic. We really don't want to make up the stories. We want to be thematic. That means we have a central message. We don't have just a topic which can be so broad that people have trouble connecting. We want to get across an idea that might last with them and that might allow them to collect the information we give them and remember it because it fits with the message. We want to be adaptive. Every audience is different. A group of adults is never the same. Sometimes they will be senior citizens. Sometimes you'll be young adults. Sometimes they're adventurers. People are in a hurry. They're wanting to get out and do things. Children, every ch child's group is different. We want to be multisensory, recognizing that if we just talk to people and they listen, that's the easiest thing to forget there is. Uh, 1957, a playwright named Freeman Tilden was asked by the director of the National Park Service to study interpretation in national parks. They'd been doing it for decades. They really needed to understand better what was the purpose of it. They knew it was effective. They were uncertain of what the principles were that guided it. Freeman Tilden was amazing. He had written a book in praise of national parks. And that was the reason Newton B. Drury su suggested that he do the study. And when he published it in 1957, it included six principles we still teach. Let's go through them one at a time. Any interpretation does, that does not somehow relate what is being displayed or described as something within the personality or experience of the visitor will be sterile. So we use things like comparisons, metaphors, and similes. These help people relate. Giving size in terms of the size of football fields or number of bathtubs of water uh, going over a waterfall or if we're relating about a battle in a civil war, the number of casualties being related to the size of a city, the population of a city, helps people with a comparison. Metaphors, like mangroves for filters and fences between land and sea, or simile, using words like like or as. This river is like a highway through rainforest for fish, people, and diverse wildlife. He said information as such is not interpretation. But revelation based upon information are entirely different things. However, all interpretation includes information. So if you're giving people facts, how does it reveal something about your site, your nation, your city, your community, uh, your event that takes it much deeper? Helping people understand that Bangladesh is unique in having one of the world's largest river deltas confluence of three important rivers, creating a huge mangrove forest that helped protect the land space in Bangladesh. More interesting than just giving people the names of the rivers and perhaps the length of them and some physical data. Tilden said interpretations art uses many arts and to some degree teachable. And it uses all the different kinds of arts. There's an old saying, I hear and I forgot, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And all the research backs that up, that if people have hands-on, multisensory involvement with an experience, they're more likely to remember it. We visited a community kitchen in Japan where uh, women in the community had asked their husbands to build a kitchen where they could teach local children the traditions of making tofu or soba noodles. And we visited there as adults and enjoyed it greatly. It was a memorable experience. We were in Korea at the National Arboretum, and they actually had us making items out of wood that we would get to take home as souvenirs. Think about the power of souvenirs, how we show people what we collect along the way. So when a, an experience is hands-on and it includes souvenirs, that's a real plus. Chief Abe of interpretation is not instruction, but provocation. Now, Tilden, in using the word provocation, 
perhaps uh, intended the more positive meaning of that word, which is inspiration, rather than the negative one to kind of irritate someone. So we we like the word inspiration. And they dressed everybody up in the Tibetan prefecture and Zhuzhaigo National Park in China. And it was a lot of fun. It was a chance to take a photo that we helps us remember the place forever. We attended tea ceremonies like the one on the right. And tea ceremonies are different in the various Asian countries that value tea as an important part of their social fabric and uh, also memorable experiences. And when you drink tea or you eat typical food, uh, adds an additional memory. Interpretation should present a whole. This gentleman from Canada was presenting in Korea and he was talking about water, water that comes out of the faucet in your your kitchen or in your home. But he was talking also about how it travels around the world in the form of glaciers, groundwater, becomes part of the ocean. When we give people the big picture, it helps them make sense of it. And sometimes we talk about things in such extreme detail that people really don't fully understand the implications of it. And this last one, he just, he observed children going to these programs at national parks and believe that we need to take a fundamentally different approach with kids. We broaden that today by saying we need to make it audience appropriate. All groups of children aren't the same. So we need to make whatever we do appropriate to the unique audience in front of us, not just have one approach that we use with every audience. We use this construct called social marketing to make the point that our visitors arrive with all sorts of different knowledge levels and uh, understanding of where they are. In some cases, they actually didn't want to visit where we are showing them. They were dragged along. Or they just met a, had a day off and they went to our park zoo or museum and they were curious. They might have learned about it from a friend and been a little bit aware of what was there. Or they may be coming back for the 10th time and they have a deep understanding of what's there. All indications are in research that once people begin to understand a unique heritage site, they begin to care about it. If they care about it, sometimes they care for it. Stewardship, that ideal of getting people to protect heritage or to be more involved in understanding and why it's important to protect the environment or to protect our culture or our art objects, things of that sort, uh, takes some effort. Freeman Tilden in his book wrote, Through Interpretation, Understanding, the midpoint here. Through understanding, appreciation, care about. Through appreciation, protection, care for. We think it's still a good model to look at and uh, that was in his 1957 book. He made the point in it that he found it in a National Park Service administrative manual. He didn't come up with it himself. But that key word is understanding. All of our research in cognitive psychology suggests that for people to understand unique sites, unique events, unique people, they have to think more deeply about it. Getting them to think more deeply is not as easy as it sounds. One of the toughest things we do in interpretation is get an audience to pay attention. Abraham Maslow published articles on motivations back in 1954, and it changed how we approach restaurants, uh, tourism, all sorts of different things. Education. He expressed a hierarchy of needs with physiological needs like food, uh, shelter at the bottom, then safety, then love and belonging, esteem, and then self-actualization. Under basic needs, he made the point that if people don't feel safe or they don't, they're hungry, they, they can't find uh, restroom or water closet services, they're not going to enjoy their experience. They also need to feel a part of the group. Sometimes name tags are used with groups that travel for a week or 10 days. Uh, sometimes it's just the guides being good enough to ask people questions and learn who they are. Self-actualization, this is kind of being the best you can be, having an experience that goes way beyond your expectations. Not easy to do, and yet it happens sometimes in tourism. 
there's a tour company on the big island of Hawaii called Hawaii Forest and Trails, and they're really good at some of this. Like basic needs, they take along not only water bottles for everybody, but day packs so people can carry their items easily, like a camera, that sort of thing. Even has a raincoat in each one because it rains suddenly on the island, and they want to make sure people have protection. When they stop for a snack, it's not only a great snack, it's food typical of the islands. It's uh, pineapple, papaya, banana nut bread, uh, using mac nuts, another product of the island. Uh, we grow coffee on the island, so it's got to have Kona coffee. Stopping at restrooms is vital, and the older the group, the more often you need to stop. Some destinations don't actually have a lot of public uh, toilets or water closets or restrooms, and yet they're essential to good tourism. Here, Hawaii Forest and Trail actually provides a stair step, recognizing that the demographics of a lot of their tour groups are older citizens and older visitors, and so they want a stair step to help get in the van, and they stand there to help them. Using people's names, we have a thing called selective attention. You hear your name, your ears perk up. And so that's a, a great way to start a conversation. We have a concept in Hawaii called aloha or love. Uh, respecting visitors so much that we want them to understand that we care about them. And that sense of welcoming includes putting a lei around their neck. A uh, can be leaves or it can be flowers woven into a necklace. And it's a way of welcoming that makes you feel very special. This is the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona, and they actually have volunteers who stand out in front before you pay a fee to get in to help you understand that if you become a member, you can come back as many times a year as you want to without paying additional fees. You can even give guests and other family members free passes to get in. On their grounds, they actually have some 180 volunteers that are well trained to do little programs at uh, interpretive stations, and they use this as a way of managing crowds as well, because when people are going through the site, if it's getting too crowded over looking at the mountain lions, they can go under one of the shade structures and do a little program on spiders or on lizards and attract people and uh, keep it from being so crowded. It's also a very warm environment, so shade structures are a part of the safety and security of the site. Music can be important to helping people understand culture. Portuguese instrument was adopted in Hawaii, the ukulele, and so this gentleman's teaching youngsters how to play a ukulele. We need to give people time to have the experience. Sometimes when we get them to a beautiful place, they want to relax and enjoy it. We need to, to know that. Understanding isn't just a matter of having more information. It's about having the total experience. Going to visit Mountain Gorillas in Rwanda is one of those experiences that I thought was life-changing. Uh, you see the one of the, the world's largest primate up close and personal and realize, like us, they have families, they have lives that are not dissimilar from our lives and that they care about their children, their spouses, their their lifestyle. And yet they let you have a glimpse of it. They're not, uh, in, in the case of Rwanda, they've habituated 10 groups that tourists can go visit. We can design visitor experiences that are life-changing, but it takes some effort and it takes some investment. Coming to our island, we take people out to see lava, lava flows. These are five active volcanoes on the big island. In this case, red lava was flowing. That's not always true. We can't make the volcan volcanoes perform, but certainly that's part of why people come to the island and we can take them and have them have a special experience. Maybe for some people, a peak experience. We hear from people that it's a bucket list item. They've wanted to come to the islands forever. And very often they're in their 50s or 60s or 70s seeing it for the first time. I can tell you in Amsterdam, when I went to Anne Frank house, I had read about Anne Frank and her experience of hiding in the family home during World War II. She was Jewish. She was eventually captured and died in one of the terrible genocide camps. But 
her house experience brings that all uh, to you in a, such a personal way that you can't help but be touched by what happened and think about the implications of other experiences going on around the world. Mona Lisa's in background here. For some people, seeing an art item uh, at the Louvre in Paris is a, a very special experience. They've studied for years and they've always wanted to visit it. Normandy, 9,000 Americans are buried there. And the D-Day battle that was the beginning of liberating Europe uh, by the Allies, very touching experience. I can tell you for me, it was a peak experience. We can do things to ha help people have a peak experience. And it's, it's a matter of Vista experience design. You have to make an effort to think about what it is that might be very special for people. In some cases, it can be asking them if they're if they're already very enthusiastic and they've been there many times and they even have a home nearby, maybe a vacation home, asking them to volunteer. That can be one of the ways to connect them way beyond just being a visitor. We say if you do a really good job with the basic needs of people in a tourism experience, you flip the triangle. They spend most of their time having that bucket list experience, that self-actualization, being the best they can be. We also teach in uh, training guides the Pine and Gilmore's theory. These uh, Pine and Gilmore are PhDs at Harvard who wrote a book about the experience economy. And they made the point that the ag economy has always been here people raising food, selling it locally at a farmer's market. And today we have farmer's markets are in a revival in the United States. They're everywhere. I've seen them in Europe as well. I've seen them in Asia, uh, in Africa. The, when the manufacturing can, economy came along, you might think of a birthday cake in the ag economy. We would have ground the flour. We would have used local honey or sorghum to sweeten the cake, local eggs, and we would have uh, whipped up some sort of icing to put on the cake. In the manufacturing economy, we buy cake mix. We buy an icing mix. We spend 7 or $8 dollars in U.S. dollars, and we have a cake. And we know what it costs. We, we know what stores sell those cake mixes at the best price. Or we can go to some of our grocery stores these days, and they make a cake for us for $20. So we're buying that service. In the experience economy, we buy the birthday party. We pay a lot more money. Uh, we have places in the U.S. that charge $100, and you take your six children, your child and their five friends there, and they get pizzas, and they have a clown tying balloons into shapes of animals, and you get a birthday cake, and it's an experience. One of the traits of the experience is you're willing to pay more for an experience than for a commodity like a cake mix. And so in tourism, it allows you to create experiences that have greater value, that are likely to bring more uh, profit to the organization, to the community. They should be thematic. Everything should tie together into a, a central idea or message. You harmonize impressions with positive cues. You eliminate negative cues. I often use examples that are common in the United States and are becoming common in very many other countries that uh, McDonald's is one of those international corporations that started in Chicago, Illinois area, and we're selling hamburgers all over the world. And it's a service economy business. You expect the prices to be affordable. You expect the food quality to be predictable, but you probably don't want to pay. $20, $30 for lunch, you expect it to be more economical. If I go to McDonald's for a cup of coffee for a dollar and a half, I get a really nice cup of coffee. However, they want people to come and go. They're a business that likes churn, that likes their uh, guests to change frequently. If you go to Starbucks, they want you to stick around. They're an experience economy business. Harmonize impressions with positive cues. Starbucks has those 
carpeted floors, comfortable chairs, newspapers to read, nice music, and the whole place smells like freshly brewed coffee and pastries, wonderful things to eat. They've eliminated the negative cues like service staff emptying trash barrels right in front of you or cleaning the tables while you're sitting there. They sell a memorabilia appropriate to their uh, coffee theme, uh, coffee from all over the world. They often sell you coffee makers, coffee containers that are creative. And think about it. You eat something, you uh, smell something, you see it, you hear the noise. Levels are very low and very pleasant with music. Engages all five senses. Well, Pine and Gilmore make the point that in an experience economy, people expect more, but they're willing to pay more. Lisa Brochu, my wife and training partner, wrote a book called Interpretive Planning, and in it, she has a Vista experience model. And she makes the point that Vista experiences start at the decision to go somewhere. And that sets up the experience because we create expectations. If we advertise that this is going to be a world-class experience at our site, guess what? We have to be a world-class experience. Usually we suggest you under-promise and over-deliver. Entry, what's it like when you arrive at the site? Is there trash on the ground? Is, is the area clean, well-kept, maintained well? Are you greeted by guests like the volunteer at the Desert Museum? Connections is the actual experience. What happens when you're there? What does the guide do that makes it a memorable visit? The exit is, what's it like when you leave? Do they thank you for coming? Do they invite you to post on social media? Maybe they even sell postcards or give them away related to their site so that you send something to a friend or family member. They want a commitment. They're wanting that you will tell your friends, post on social media, maybe sign up for an additional visit, come back even the next day. You set that all up at the decision point. And very often these days, that's on the internet, that's on our websites. So they have to be accurate. And yet, ideally, they underpromise. I can tell you in places like uh, Africa, where people go to see elephants and lions and uh, things of that sort, or in Alaska, where they go to see bears and uh, caribou and moose, they refer to the big five, the five animals people most want to see, the kind of bucket list experience with wildlife. They usually will promise you that they'll show you three of them when they know they'll usually show you four or five. But they don't want to say, I guarantee you, you'll see all five, because then if you go there and you only see four, you're disappointed. Dr. Sam Ham, whose definition we're using, says that people remember themes, they forget facts that if you just give people a litany of facts that go all over the place, later they're less likely to remember any of what you told them. Themes get people to think more deeply about the experience. They're advanced organizers. They help people know what's going to happen while they're there. They help them remember the information as long as the information you give them all relates back to the theme. They help make lasting memories that are more likely to build advocates for your site. We think strong themes are a complete sentence. They have both tangibles and intangibles, those universals that I talked about. They get you to think more deeply about where you are and why it's unique. And they answer the so what question. So what question is, why am I here? Why did I take this tour? Sometimes I leave a tour and go, I'm not sure why we came here. This was boring. Got a lot of information. It really didn't help me understand anything. Theme is a message, a thought-provoking idea. A researcher named Thorndike proved that theme results in more memorable experiences. He also made the point in the third bullet item here that theme delivery at the start is the strongest placement, second strongest is at the end, and third is in the middle. Well, speech teachers in the United States anyway have been saying for years, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, Tell them what you told them. And we think that still works. Ozerbell studied advanced organizers like themes and said that people are more likely to pay attention 
if they know what's going to happen in an experience. So what we tell people in an introduction to a, a tour, a visitor experience is very critical, that entry level of the experience. Lindblad Expeditions, who uh, one of the best tour companies in the world and very often takes people on boats to unique places like the Galapagos Islands, they encourage donations to Darwin Research Center in the Galapagos because they monitor the wildlife there. And the wildlife is vulnerable to everything, uh, pollution, uh, harassment by tourists, uh, just overuse of the uh, islands. And so it's critical that someone continue to monitor them so that those uh, wildlife experiences remain. Lindblad asked Dr. Sam Ham to study their tours and messaging. He determined that their tours were really good. He spent several years going on their tours and he changed their themes, their messages. Donations to the to the Darwin Research Center increased by 270%. So just changing a message actually changed the commitment of people to support monitoring of the islands. Questioning is another important part of this. I said earlier that interpretive guiding is a conversation. Open questions uh, are where we start. Where are you from? I mean, here it's, it's marketing 101, if you will. It's a chance to ask people, have you been here before? What are you hoping to do and see? What captured your interest and made you come to this great site? Or how did you first learn about mountain gorillas if you're in Rwanda and you made this long journey to get to see these unique animals? There's no right or wrong answer. You've started a conversation. You don't want your guest to feel like you're judging what they say. You want them to feel comfortable responding. You can focus them on things that they're seeing there. Which building here looks the oldest to you? What do you notice about the forest? And on and on. Any of these questions are getting people to look more closely because you want them to think about where they are, why it's unique, why it's uh, going to be a very special experience. Interpretive questions, you're trying to get them to analyze, to think more deeply about it. Why do you think the streets are so wide in this 1700s heritage community? Or in a forest on a mountainside, you'll see trees that look like all the limbs are pointing one direction because the, the wind does that. And getting people to help analyze, that's a great thing. You can ask them a question at the end that you're not really looking for an answer. It's what we call a rhetorical question. You want them to think when they leave about what you've been talking about. Asking people in a heritage community, how might we help preserve these historic buildings? Because we're sharing this history with our children and grandchildren. We want them to come back and see it much as we've seen it. What will it be like if we lose our mangroves? Can you think about how your community can take better care of the land and the water? We think great interpretation is thematic. It involves back and forth conversations, in other words, questions, and a unique experience, one that's well thought out from decision point to commitment, what people do differently if you did a very good job. That's not easy. And we think interpretive planning is a part of that effort. If you really do a great job, you develop lasting relationships with your guests. You do get return visits and longer stays. They do use their social media to tell their family and friends how excited they are about where they were. And they're willing to spend more for experiences than for tours that they view as a commodity. If I if the tour took an hour, maybe that should only be six dollars. I know the fee to go with mountain gorillas is fifteen hundred dollars in Rwanda for one hour, and we've always urged our guides there to say, "Thank you for donating to the protection of mountain gorillas, three hundred and sixty-five days a year, twenty-four hours, seven days a week," because that fifteen hundred dollars is shared with the local community to help people that live near the gorillas protect them. It's not for your one hour experience. And guess what? They sell those tours year in and year out. Our conversations with guests matter. It's now when they originally estimated gorilla tourism would bring $70,000 to the country of Rwanda when they started it. it now brings over $200 million a year, they estimate. The experience economy and great interpretive experiences in tourism can make a lasting difference. If you want to think about how you might improve 
interpretive guiding in your community. We offer certified interpretive guide courses uh, virtually through Zoom, and those are available. You go to interpnet.com, I-N-T-E-R-P-N-E-T dot C-O-M, and there's a schedule of the virtual courses. And there are other trainers besides me, and they're all quite good. You can obtain books that share the knowledge of this profession. And uh, Lisa and I are authors of some of those books. You can create a local network of professionals that meet regularly to share ideas. And I think that's a great way to build that capacity in your nation or your community. These are some of the books we value a great deal. Dr. Larry Beck, Dr. Ted Gable wrote in 2011, The Gifts of Interpretation. And uh, these books are all available through Amazon.com if Amazon.com is available in your nation and you can buy through uh, credit cards. We wrote one called Personal Interpretation, which is a companion to the Certified Interpretive Guide course. Lisa wrote a book called Interpretive Planning, the 5 model M model for successful planning projects. And that's available through National Association for Interpretation or again on Amazon. Sam Ham's book is excellent. Interpretation, Making a Difference on Purpose, Fulcrum Publishing. It's available all through through, through Amazon. And by the way, it has been published in a great many languages around the world. Well, Lisa and I work as Heartfelt Associates. We no longer do a lot of active consultancy. Uh, occasionally, we, we do a, a job because we know the people well and we want to work with them. I have a regular podcast called Reflections on Interpretation, Talking Story with Guides and Interpreters. You'll find it on every one of the major audio platforms, but Apple uh, and uh, Spotify are the two most common sites from which people download that. And I talk to the book authors and many of the people have been doing this throughout their careers. And I think it's another way to learn about what's going on out there. Don't hesitate to con me, contact me by email if you have a question. I hope that in your guiding, wherever you work, that you're finding ways to make better connections with people, help them have experiences that create lasting memories. Uh, tourism is a major economic driver in most of the nations of the world these days. And a lot of it is been there, done that experiences. Uh, you, you go there once and you're never going back. We think interpretive guiding at heritage sites gives people a reason to make a memory that will bring them back and that help them suggest to a friend it's the place to be. Thank you for joining me today. Aloha.